This podcast is brought to you by the Prospect Research Institute, where researchers come to learn, innovate, and connect. The one position that I feel is more crucial to our future than anything is continuing to staff up our research team. Welcome to Prospect Research Chat Bites, a podcast by and for prospect research professionals. I'm Jennifer Filla. Today, I'm talking with Caroline Riseborough, President and CEO at Trillium Health Partners Foundation. Hello, Caroline. Thank you for joining me today on Chat Bites. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So I was on your LinkedIn profile and I couldn't help but notice that you started at Trillium in February of this year. And then, of course, you know, by March, the world had shut down. How was that coming into a a wonderful leadership position like that? And then the sudden change, how did that go for you? Well, um, I I can't help but laugh because either you kind of laugh or cry, but you know, to your point, I, I actually started at the end of February. So I literally had two weeks on the job before everything kind of shut down. And I mean, obviously it was quite challenging. You know, you're trying to find your bearing, you're trying to meet people. I mean, I, I tell the story and I say, I didn't even get a chance to meet all of my team at the foundation, let alone get to meet folks at, at the hospital and even, you know, finish my, my tours of the hospital and such. But you know what, at at the same time, I kind of look back and I think, you know, wow, like what a great test of leadership, um, of leadership grit, of um, being able to kind of mobilize your team through change. And uh, you know what, as difficult as uh, it was, I, I really look back and I think, you know what, these are the times where we all get to step up as, as leaders and all those things that have we, we've been learning over all these many years, you know, I, I was able to put into uh, actual practice. So all in all, it turned out fairly well. That's great. So you found the advantages of it and used them. Is that what I heard? I always say never waste a good crisis. And this is absolutely a, a crisis, but it really helped as I think crystallize as a team why we were doing what we were doing. And one sort of good thing that that came out of COVID was never has healthcare been more top of mind for donors. So even though we were having to have these conversations over Zoom rather than in person, we were able to have a significant amount of meaningful conversations with donors about why healthcare and especially local healthcare is so important and why it's so important to invest in it. So I would say that is kind of the good piece that came out of COVID. Sort of brings me right into what I wanted to ask you about assessing your team. So you came on board, you barely got to meet your team and maybe not all of them in person. And then really as a new leader, you needed to assess where everyone was at, where you wanted to go. I'm curious about how you would view prospect research. How did, how did you accomplish that over time this year? What, what was your strategy or what was your perspective? It's a great question. And for a bit of context, I mean, I'm, I'm two weeks on the job, trying to assess my team, see where the gaps are, see where our strengths are. And then next thing you know, we're not even in person anymore. We're all sort of working over Zoom. And, you know, on top of it all, there were massive changes happening. So we knew fairly early into the pandemic that we weren't going to be having big groups of a thousand people together in a room. So our galas were very much going to change. We had other third party events planned like bikeathons and such. Well, those are likely not going to happen in, in times where you have to socially distance. So we actually had to really take a step back and assess what the new world was going to hold for us in terms of fundraising. And obviously kind of big events would have to move virtual. But it also, I think, really put a fine point on the fact that it was still our our major gift work that is absolutely critical. It's the support of our senior volunteers that's absolutely critical in a time where we need more conversations happening rather than less to continue the momentum and supporting our, our hospital and the community. And of course, research is such a critical part of that. So one of the things we did early on was, you know, at a time where we were feeling some of the kind of economic stress of, of having to cancel many of our big fundraising events, we actually trained up almost every single person on our major gift team to do research as well. And so we've had someone 
dedicated to doing that work, but we actually knew we needed more strength. And so that was one of the decisions we made early on around, around research. And I think as we kind of get through this year and, and I can share more, but we've actually had a, a really good year. The one position that I feel is more crucial to our future than anything is continuing to staff up our research team. I love it. That's like music to my ears, Caroline. I, I can't tell you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Fantastic. And I have had clients in your kind of position who have also said that to me. And the, the first time I heard it, I was just sort of, I wasn't sure they were talking to me <laughs> because it was new. But information technology is really driving data analysis, you know, the using data is really driving a lot of strategy in all sectors, but certainly fundraising. How did you get everyone on board with learning more about research? Like, how did you roll that out? And then how did that affect people's view of research? Well, I think a couple things, it became really apparent to my team as I was kind of trying to build up their sort of major gift muscle that you can't really have a starting discussion about anybody unless you have research. Otherwise, you're having a pretty vague conversation. So as we were kind of getting ready to launch our, our campaign, which we're going to do next year, we're going to launch a 10-year capital campaign. We needed to start looking at our, our pipeline and, and prospects and even going out and, and recruiting a cabinet. And if we didn't have research, the conversation didn't go very far. So I think it just became really apparent to my team as we were starting to put good practices in place that research is really the fundamental starting place for a major gift program, for building a campaign, for building a cabinet. And they kind of got to see it in person. So again, we recognize that sort of just putting research in, in one place, I mean, that's obviously kind of a, a model and, and it works and I've, I've seen it many a time. But we all have to be able to do our own research as well, because that is the, the nature of major gift work. And so I think I, I just really showed my team through practice how important prospect research is. And then as, as you're thinking of staffing up, especially in view of a future campaign, where do you want to do that in prospect research? Like what kind of different tasks or specialties do you want within your own researchers? There's different sort of levels of, of research. And I'll talk to you a little bit about kind of, I would say, sort of the, the basics and then how you kind of get to the transformational research. And I would say, at, you know, at Trillium, we're starting a campaign. So we're, we're again, also kind of building up our, our research capability. But really, as you have names identified, it's important to do a research on, on that name and on that, that prospect. And so what are their giving affinities, what is their actual wealth capacity, but also even what's important to them, what's their connection to your cause. In our case, we want to find that there's been a connection to, to Trillium. And obviously, because of, of patient privacy, it's not always evident. So it's important just to really kind of, if a name has come your way, that our, our prospect research helps us understand that person so that when we approach them, we're doing it in a very kind of educated and strategic way. But I think where research really starts to evolve and where I want to get to and where I've seen it uh, become so powerful is especially as you're in campaign, you kind of start working through your prospect list and now you've got to start finding some of those rare gems. And I think researchers who are able to go out there and kind of find that needle in a haystack Maybe someone who's been under the radar, perhaps it's someone who has started a company, they've had their head down, they're not on the usual boards, or maybe they come from, let's say, an ethnic community that traditionally hasn't been on the radar. When researchers are able to find those gems, that's where when research starts to become transformational, because you're expanding the pool and, and you're always looking for those new folks that maybe haven't engaged in a charitable cause. And so this is where I think you can kind of go from research that's very kind of foundational to research that can be transformational. One example, I was at another organization and there was some research done on someone who is kind of up and coming in a company. And this is probably going back about six, seven years now. 
And now they've become one of the richest people in Canada. <laughs> so they have, you know, massive wealth capacity, but they were identified really early on before they even got to that stage. And it's always easier to engage people when they're kind of early in their journey or mid in their journey, rather than when they've reached the pinnacle and everybody else is after them. That's a wonderful perspective. Finding people who are in the beginning or in the middle of their sort of wealth accumulation and philanthropic journey. I don't think I've ever heard that articulated quite that way. And I think it's so important because we're always looking for people almost at, at the uh, end of, let's say, their, their wealth journey, or they've kind of come into it. But so is everybody else. So if you're able to find folks earlier on in their journey, but you see the uh, potential trajectory, I think actually it is easier to engage. And folks respect that you've engaged them along the way, not just when they've made it. Is it a matter of hiring a new person to do that searching research to, to uncover those gems? Or is it training someone who is already doing good profile research for you? How, how do you find someone who has that kind of skill set? Well, I think all organizational culture and individual performance is really based on this kind of triangle that, that I've used. And, you know, we, we talk about people having the skill. So that would be kind of the bottom of the triangle. That's really foundational. Then on one side of the triangle, you have sort of the motivation. So people have the skill to be able to do this kind of research. They're motivated to do it. But I feel like the, the last part of the triangle, we don't spend enough time on, and that's license. Giving people the, the kind of freedom and permission to work outside of their usual box. So sometimes people are motivated to think outside the box, but they don't feel like they have the permission to do so, right? They've got to do the usual profile research and usually kind of work on who's been identified on, on the, the pipeline. And they don't always have that license to go kind of searching for some of the unusual suspects. So I, I think as leaders, it's so important that we give people not only kind of the, the skill and not only the motivation, but also the license to try and do things outside the box. And, and I just find that we don't do enough of that. You have skill, motivation, and the license to do something different. It's almost the way, I think it was Google that would give people Fridays to work on their own project. Exactly. And, and that's a perfect example of, of giving people license or some might call it sort of permission. As leaders, we can easily take that for granted, but particularly in an area like, like research, which is sometimes a bit formulaic if you're creating a profile or investigating kind of the, the pipeline. And so it, it seems just very sensical. Like, of course, people have license, but, but oftentimes they really don't. So I always make sure with my staff, whether it's researchers or whether folks in different roles, that they always feel like they have the license to be able to do something new, to innovate, to think outside the box. It also requires a good deal of time. So what I hear back from researchers when they want to do what we like to call proactive research, finding those gems, is that they're so busy churning out profiles that they never have the time because we have to sort of unwind, you know, a little and, and try different things, uh, not knowing what's really going to work for a particular constituency. Do you find that it's the leader has to create that space of time for people to innovate? I think so. I mean, I think it is always critical for leaders to make sure that they're carving out time for their, their employees to kind of innovate. Otherwise, you're never going to get anything other than the product that you already have. And we know that our industry changes, donors change, and we've got to continue to, to evolve ourselves. I would say too, though, that sometimes as, as employees, as staff, we always uh, will have more than we can do in a day on our, our plates. It's just the nature of, of work. And, you know, I go back to this kind of great Stephen Covey analogy, which is you're in a boat and you're on a lake and your boat has a hole in it and you've got to get across to the other side. And you're rowing, 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 which is kind of, you know, as doing the 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 day to day. But every now and then you've got to spend a bit of time patching the the hole for the longer term. And then you go back to rowing a bit and then you patch the hole and then you row a bit. Well, I think that's sort of the short term and long term thinking, right? We do our short term. That's the rowing. We've got to do it. We're trying to get across to the other side. But every now and then we've got to stop <laughs> and and think bigger and patch the hole and can also 
be about figuring out the, the future and going in down different paths. And so as leaders and even as, as employees, we've got to be able to do a bit of both in, in, our, in our week and in our month. That's a great analogy. I love it. So now you've given us two things as researchers that we could really take to leadership if we needed to convince them that there should be time for this. We have your triangle approach and this Covey analogy to help persuade that indeed this is worthwhile. Do you have an example perhaps that, or a story you could share of when a, a researcher really came through in an innovative way and, and saved the day? Oh, there's so many good research stories I have. A great example, there, there was actually a donor in our uh, donor base who had given 15 years ago, and we, we hadn't really engaged, and the researcher brought this person up, and they said, listen, their business has significantly expanded. I'm not sure why we haven't been engaging with this person. Well, just this morning, I learned that this individual sold some, some stock in their company that was worth millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, obviously they'll have a tax event and it's a perfect time to kind of reach out and, and re-engage. So again, I think when researchers can be proactive as opposed to just reactive and the, the reactive being, oh, can you please do this donor profile? Whereas proactive is, oh, I've noticed this person on our radar just had a major tax event in their life and, and now might be a good time to, to reach out. That can really make a massive difference between good research and great research. Great examples. I love the winning stories. They're always so exciting. So before I let you go, if a researcher is thinking, you know, someday I want to lead a healthcare foundation or a nonprofit, and I'm a researcher now, what, what kind of education or what kind of things can they do in their career to start laying the groundwork for that? One thing that helped me in my career so much, and, and I almost did it a little bit unintentionally because I'm just a curious person. But I would say this to anybody, whether you're a researcher or you're, you know, doing direct marketing or you are a major gift officer, the key piece is that if you really want to lead an organization, it's so important to get as varied of a skill set as you can. And I think good leaders are looking for people who are interested in, in doing this. So, you know, if you're a researcher now, why don't you try doing some major gift public facing work and try a role like that. If you're um, maybe in research now, why not try going into some of the community events and try, try your hand at that for a bit? And, you know, so many of the skills are obviously transferable because you need a keen eye, you need curiosity, you need someone who can project manage, get things done. And so I would just say, continue to, to move around. I think so many folks think that a career is sort of a ladder climb, right? You're always needing to kind of take the next step up, take the next step up. And I sort of describe my career as like a jungle gym. You know, there were many times where I just, I took similar roles or sometimes I took smaller roles and then made a bigger leap. And I kind of moved around all over the place. But at the same time, I think because I was curious, I had had so much varied experience. Sometimes when you go into a new area and you're not a subject matter expert, you have to lean on your leadership skills and, and you know, the, the team to kind of get through and be successful. And these are the kind of skills that you need if you want to lead an organization one day. Very good advice. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Caroline. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. That was Caroline Riseborough, President and CEO at Trillium Health Partners Foundation. Were you as excited as I was to hear her expound on prospect research as a critical component of fundraising success? Clearly, I haven't heard that kind of talk enough because it still takes my breath away. Whether you're leading a nonprofit or you're a prospect research professional, Caroline clearly articulated why and how prospect research can transform fundraising. Now you can use your motivation to gain new skills at the Prospect Research Institute, of course, and take some license to find innovative solutions for your organization. Go get them.
Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come check out the Prospect Research Institute's learning community. It's a membership community with powerful resources, great discussions, and comprehensive courses. Check it out at member.prospectresearchinstitute.org. I'd love to have you join me as a member of the learning community. See you there.